My friends, at last, it is time. In today's Wrath of Math lesson, we are going to prove Menger's theorem. Let's quickly read through this statement of the theorem. Let u and v be two non-adjacent vertices in a graph G. Then the minimum number of vertices in a UV separating set, that's the minimum number of vertices we need to delete to disconnect U and V, that minimum number is equal to the maximum number of internally disjoint UV paths in the graph G. I'm assuming that you are basically familiar with this theorem and the concepts involved. But if you're not, there are links in the description to my lessons on separating sets, internally disjoint paths, and a lesson introducing the theorem without proof. So let's not spend too much time dilly-dallying in this lesson because the proof is fairly long. Quickly, I'll mention that I definitely don't think this result is obvious, certainly the proof isn't trivial, but I do think it's pretty intuitive. If we've got these two non-adjacent vertices, u and v, and we need to delete, say, three vertices at least in order to disconnect them, it seems reasonable that there must be a maximum of three internally disjoint paths connecting those vertices. If there was a fourth, then obviously deleting three vertices wouldn't be enough to completely disconnect the vertices. So I think it's pretty intuitive, but again, if you want more of an introduction to the theorem, check the description for a link to that lesson. Now we're going to get into the proof, and as it turns out, this is going to be a proof by induction. What do you think we're going to use induction on? Turns out we're going to use induction on the size of the graph. Thus, the basis step of our induction proof is to prove that the result is true for all graphs that have a size of zero. These are graphs that have zero edges, which are called empty graphs. As is often the case, the proof is pretty trivial for the basis step. Menger's theorem is certainly true for all empty graphs because given two vertices, say u and v, in an empty graph, one that has no edges, u and v clearly must be disconnected since there are no edges. And so the minimum number of vertices in a uv separating set is zero. We don't need to delete any vertices to disconnect u and v. And of course, there are also zero internally disjoint UV paths. There are no UV paths because there are no edges in these empty graphs. So the basis step is done. Menger's theorem is true for all graphs that have a size of zero, which are called empty graphs. Then let's move on to the induction step. For the induction step, we assume that Menger's theorem is true for all graphs of size less than m, where m is just some natural number, and of course we know that m is greater than zero, because we already proved the theorem for graphs that have zero edges. Then, to complete the proof, all we have to do is prove the theorem is also true for all graphs of size m. So, we'll say let g be a graph of size m. Remember that Menger's theorem is about any pair of non-adjacent vertices in a graph, so next we'll just take two non-adjacent vertices in the graph G. We'll call those vertices U and V, so we'll say let U and V be non-adjacent vertices of G. To prove that Menger's theorem is true in this graph, we need to show that the minimum cardinality of a UV separating set is equal to the maximum number of internally disjoint UV paths. So we'll suppose that the number of vertices in a minimum UV separating set is K. So we're supposing that a minimum of k vertices need to be deleted in order to separate or disconnect the vertices u and v. And we need to prove that the maximum number of internally disjoint UV paths is also k. Quickly, let's mention that we know the result is true for k equals 0 and for k equals 1. If there are zero vertices in a minimum UV separating set, then zero vertices need to be deleted to disconnect U and V, so U and V are already disconnected, which means there are also zero internally disjoint paths connecting U and V. Thus, we know the theorem always holds if K is equal to zero. If K is equal to one, then there must also be a maximum of one internally disjoint UV path. 
If we could find two internally disjoint UV paths, then certainly deleting a single vertex couldn't possibly disconnect U and V. So again, if the minimum number of vertices we need to delete to disconnect U and V is one, then there's certainly a maximum of just one internally disjoint UV paths. There may be more than a single path connecting U and V, like we have in this diagram here, but they can't possibly be disjoint, since deleting a single vertex still has to disconnect U and V. So the theorem is also true whenever k is equal to 1. If the minimum number of vertices we need to delete to disconnect U and V is 1, then the maximum number of UV paths is also 1. Thus, my friends, for the rest of the proof, we can proceed assuming that k is greater than or equal to 2. One last thing we want to point out, which takes care of a lot of the work we need to do, is to establish that certainly there are not more than k internally disjoint UV paths. If there were more than k internally disjoint UV paths, then absolutely deleting k vertices couldn't possibly disconnect U and V. But remember, we're assuming that there are k vertices in a minimum UV separating set, so there are k vertices that when deleted, disconnect U and V. But if there were more than k internally disjoint UV paths, then no matter what k vertices we delete, there would still be a path left over connecting U and V. So we know that much, that there are not more than k internally disjoint UV paths. Thus, only one thing remains to be proven. We must prove that there are k internally disjoint UV paths. And then, since we know that there are not more than k internally disjoint paths, we will have established k as the maximum, proving the theorem. All right, moving on to case one. That's right, this is going to be a proof by cases. There are three cases we need to address. The first case is that there exists a minimum UV separating set, we'll call W, in the graph G containing a vertex X that is adjacent to both U and V. Remember again that U and V are our non-adjacent vertices that can be separated by deleting a minimum of K vertices. Thus, our minimum separating set W must have K vertices we can pretty easily apply our induction hypothesis in this case. If there exists a minimum UV separating set that contains a vertex adjacent to both U and V, and again we're calling that vertex X, then consider the graph G minus the vertex X. Certainly the graph G minus X has a size that's less than M because our original graph G has a size of M, and once we delete X, we get rid of at least two edges, so the size of G minus X is less than M. Additionally, what do we know must be a minimum UV separating set in the graph G minus X? Well, of course, our original minimum separating set W minus that vertex X must be a minimum UV separating set in G minus X. Because if there was a quicker way to disconnect U and V than just deleting the vertex X and then deleting the rest of the vertices in the set W, then W couldn't possibly be a minimum UV separating set in G. So you can think of it like this. If W is a minimum UV separating set in G, and of course W contains the vertex X, then the quickest way to disconnect U and V would be to delete X and then delete the rest of the vertices in W. Thus, when we look at the graph G minus X, the rest of the vertices in W must make up a minimum UV separating set in order to avoid contradiction. That's a crucial detail, so I hope that makes sense. If not, listen to the explanation again, think about it yourself a little bit too, make sure that is clear. Now, importantly, what do we know about the cardinality of W minus the vertex X? Well, we know that its cardinality must be K minus 1, because the cardinality of W is K, so once we delete an element of W, that leaves K minus 1 elements behind. Then what can we do? Of course, we can apply our induction hypothesis to the graph G minus X which tells us since there are k-1 vertices in a minimum UV separating set in G minus X, there is a maximum of k-1 internally disjoint UV paths in G minus X. And then we get the final point of case 1. 
these k minus 1 internally disjoint uv paths of g minus x together with the path p going from u to x to v make up k internally disjoint uv paths in the original graph g. Remember that vertex x is the vertex of our minimum uv separating set w in g, which is adjacent to both u and v. So that gives us one uv path that isn't in g minus x, since g minus x doesn't contain the vertex x. So we just include that path along with the k minus 1 internally disjoint uv paths that we know are in g minus x, and that guarantees us k internally disjoint uv paths in g, and that proves the theorem in case 1. Alrighty, on to case 2, and this is the trickiest case of the proof. The other two are pretty easy. Case 2 is that there exists a minimum uv separating set, say w, in the graph g containing a vertex that is not adjacent to u and containing a vertex that is not adjacent to v. And the vertex not adjacent to u doesn't have to be the same as the vertex not adjacent to v. They could be the same or they could be different. I'll point out as well, this minimum separating set W could also contain a vertex that's adjacent to both U and V, in which case we could apply our case 1 proof. So the point is that not all of these cases are mutually exclusive, but together they will cover all possibilities. To help us talk about our minimum UV separating set W, let's say that W contains the vertices W1, w2, and so on up through wk, because remember, the minimum uv separating sets must contain k vertices. Then what we're going to do in this case of the proof is sort of split the graph g into two subgraphs, one containing the vertex u and one containing the vertex v. Then using some clever arguments, we're going to be able to apply our induction hypothesis to both subgraphs, get the existence of some paths, and stitch them together. So let's see how it works. We're going to say let GU be the subgraph of G that consists of all UWI paths, where only that last vertex WI is in W for each path. And we define a subgraph GV a similar way. Let GV be the subgraph of G consisting of all VWI paths, where only the last vertex WI is in W for each path. Now, to save me some writing, here's a diagram that's going to help us walk through the rest of this case. So, our original graph kind of looks something like this, right? We've got our non-adjacent vertices, u and v, and they're separated by some set of vertices that contains w1, w2, all the way through wk. And then what we've just done in defining these subgraphs is we've sort of split the graph in two. This is what our subgraph gu looks like. And this is what our subgraph GV looks like. Let's clarify that detail that only the last vertex of each path, WI, is in W for each path. That means for each path in this graph that goes from U to some vertex in W, the path stops as soon as it gets to W. So for example, there's no path that does something like going from U to W1 and then to some other vertex of W. The path stops as soon as it gets to the set W. Thus, our original graph G may have contained some edges between vertices of W, but because of how we've constructed these subgraphs, the subgraphs do not contain those edges. You might be thinking, okay, I kind of see where this is going. Maybe we can apply our induction hypothesis to guarantee the existence of k internally disjoint paths going from u to the vertices of w, and same thing over here, k internally disjoint paths going from the vertices of w to v, and then stitch them together, and then we'd have k internally disjoint paths in the original graph g. The only problem is that our induction hypothesis can only be used on a pair of non-adjacent vertices. And of course, it also has to be used in a graph whose size is less than m. So we certainly can't apply the induction hypothesis to u and this set of k vertices all at once. But there's a really clever trick we can use to get around this problem. 
Suppose we slightly change this subgraph GU. Let's call it G prime U now. In this new version, we add a new vertex called V prime. And we join this vertex by an edge to every vertex in the minimum UV separating set W. So to make that clear, while these white lines represent paths, these green lines are edges. So we've just added a new vertex V prime that is adjacent to every vertex of W. Now, if we can be sure that the size of this graph is less than M, we could apply our induction hypothesis to U and V prime to guarantee the existence of those K internally disjoint paths we were hoping for. Because clearly in this graph, W, which has K vertices, is a minimum U V prime separating set. If we could separate u and v prime by deleting some smaller set of vertices, then we also would have been able to separate u and v by deleting that set of smaller vertices in the original graph g, but of course that would contradict the fact that w is a minimum separating set in g. So w, which has k vertices, is a minimum u v prime separating set in this graph. But what is this graph's size? Is it less than m? It absolutely is because of the assumption that defines this case of the proof. Because in W, there is a vertex that's not adjacent to U and a vertex that's not adjacent to V in the graph G. So why is that important? It's important because in the original graph G, which looked kind of like this, at least one of these paths connecting a vertex in W to the vertex V must have had a length greater than 1 because at least one of these vertices, say W2 for example, isn't adjacent to V, so that path going from W2 to V must have a length of at least 2, which of course consists of at least 2 edges. Whereas in this subgraph G'U, these are all just single edges going from each vertex of W to the vertex V', which is sort of like a stand-in for the vertex V. Now again, it's possible that in G there were some edges joining vertices in W to each other, which are certainly not in this subgraph because of how we've defined it. But we don't know if such edges exist in G or not. So we need to use this other argument. And because it's super important and I think pretty tricky, let's just run through it quickly one more time. Because since at least one of these vertices isn't adjacent to V, it must take at least two edges to get to V. Whereas in our wonderful subgraph G prime U, it's just a single edge connecting each vertex of W to the vertex V prime. So we can conclude without a doubt the size of G prime U is less than M. So finally, since as we went over, the cardinality of a minimum U V prime separating set in this graph is K, the induction hypothesis, tells us that there exists a maximum of k internally disjoint u v prime paths in this graph. And because of the structure of this graph, we know that each one of those paths consists of a u w i path that we'll call p i, followed by the edge w i v prime. Clearly, any u v prime path in this graph has to pass through a vertex of w. So since there's a maximum of k internally disjoint u v prime paths, we know that each one of them must pass through a different one of the k vertices in w. So by adding this vertex v prime, we were able to apply our induction hypothesis and we basically funneled all of those paths through these vertices in w. We forced them to go through those vertices. Really cool strategy. Now I hope it's pretty clear to see how we could apply the exact same arguments to our other subgraph GV. We'd turn it into the subgraph G prime V by adding a new vertex U prime, which is a sort of stand-in for the vertex U. We would join this vertex U prime to every vertex of W. Then again, we know that W makes up a minimum U prime V separating set, and it is a minimum U prime V separating set with a cardinality of K. Then we'd make the same arguments as before to show that the size of this graph has to be less than M.
because remember, we not only assumed that W contains a vertex not adjacent to V, which is what we used over here with this subgraph, but we also assumed that it contains a vertex not adjacent to U. So remember the logic, one of these paths in the original graph G, going from a vertex of W to the vertex U, has to consist of at least two edges. Whereas we only need a single edge to go from each vertex of W to U prime in this graph, so guaranteed its size is less than M. Again, it's the exact same argument we made before regarding the size of this graph. And so we apply our induction hypothesis and come to the same sort of conclusion about this graph. We know that there exists a maximum of k internally disjoint u prime v paths in g prime v. Additionally, we know that each one of those paths consists of a wi v path that we could call qi preceded by the edge u prime wi. So this here, of course, is the path q1 preceded by this edge u prime w1. So it's a fairly sophisticated argument in this case of the proof, but it is the same argument applied twice to slightly different graphs. Then finally, we get our concluding statement. This is where we stitch the paths together. The k paths consisting of pi followed by qi for i ranging from 1 to k. These are the paths that we just prove exist. Joining those together gives us k internally disjoint paths in g. I think it's very clear how given one of these paths, like P1 going from U to W1 and Q1 going from W1 to V, we can stitch those together to get a UV path in G. And we know that these stitched together paths in G will be internally disjoint because neither of these graphs have any vertices in common except for the vertices of W where we are attaching these paths together. If they did have some vertex in common, say x somewhere in these graphs, then deleting the vertices of w wouldn't separate u and v in g, because we could just go from u to that vertex x, and then from that vertex x to the vertex v, sort of like a portal. Okay, so I think that'll do it for case three of the proof. That's the hardest one. We're pretty much home free. We've just guaranteed the existence of k internally disjoint paths in our graph G. Let's go ahead and move on to the final case. Case 3 is where, for any minimum UV separating set, either every vertex in the minimum separating set is adjacent to U and not V, or every vertex in the minimum separating set is adjacent to V but not U. Let's start our argument with a very special type of path, a UV geodisc. So we'll say let P, which goes from U to V, be a UV geodisc. That means it's a shortest UV path. I want to point out that we know P has at least two internal vertices, which we're calling X and Y, because if it only had one internal vertex, say Y, then of course y would be adjacent to u and adjacent to v. So y would have to be an element of any uv separating set. But if a minimum separating set contains a vertex adjacent to both u and v, then we would be in case one of the proof. So we can assume that this uv geodisc contains at least two internal vertices x and y. In particular, x and y are the first two internal vertices of the path. So however many other internal vertices there are, x and y are the names for the first two internal vertices. The first two vertices that follow u. Of course, since x and y are consecutive vertices in a path, they are adjacent to each other. So let's call the edge that joins x and y e. Then consider the graph G minus E. So we've deleted that edge joining X and Y. If we delete the edge joining X and Y and then consider the graph G minus E, certainly every minimum UV separating set in G minus E has to contain at least K minus one vertices. We've made this sort of argument several times already. If G minus E contained a minimum UV separating set with say K minus two vertices, then in our original graph G, we could delete those k minus two vertices and delete the vertex X or the vertex Y. That would then separate U and V by deleting only k minus one vertices. 
but that would contradict the assumption at the very beginning of our proof that a minimum UV separating set in G contains K vertices. So again, every minimum UV separating set in G minus E has to contain at least K minus one vertices in order to avoid contradiction. What we actually are going to show is that every minimum UV separating set in G minus E contains exactly K vertices. Then we'll apply our induction hypothesis and we'll be done. But in order to do that, we're going to use a contradiction proof. So we'll say SFC, suppose for contradiction, that every minimum UV separating set in G minus E contains K minus one vertices exactly. Then let's name one of these minimum UV separating sets. We'll call it S and say it contains vertices S1, S2, and so on, all the way up through some final vertex S K minus one, since there are K minus one vertices in this set. If once we delete the edge E from G, putting us into this graph G minus E, if after deleting E, we need to delete a minimum of these vertices to disconnect U and V, then certainly in our original graph G, if we delete, say, the vertex X, which will have the effect of deleting the edge E, if we do that, and then also delete the vertices of S, that would be a minimum way to separate U and V. So we'll write that out. So again, if in the graph G minus E, S is a minimum UV separating set, then in our original graph G, that same set S, union with the vertex X must be a minimum UV separating set in that original graph G. Because again, deleting X will have the effect of also deleting its incident edge E. And then of course, deleting S is a minimum way to separate U and V. But remember our assumption here in case three, that every vertex of a minimum UV separating set in G is either adjacent to U but not V, or adjacent to V but not U. We know the vertex X is adjacent to U because X follows U in this path. Then, since all the vertices of S, as well as X, are part of a minimum UV separating set in G, all the vertices of S must be adjacent to U and not adjacent to V. So again, since X is adjacent to U and X is part of a minimum UV separating set with the vertices of S, that means all the vertices of S are adjacent to U as well, since this is case three. However, and now we're right at the end, in the same way that deleting X gets rid of the edge E, and then we can separate U and V by deleting the vertices of S, we could also delete the vertex Y, which has the effect of deleting its incident edge E. So for the same reasons that S union with the set containing the vertex X is a minimum UV separating set in G, we could get another minimum UV separating set by including the vertex Y instead of X. But since all the vertices of S are adjacent to U and Y is in a minimum UV separating set of G, that means that Y is adjacent to the vertex U as well. But that, my friends, is a contradiction. Because remember our path P that we introduced a while ago is a geodisc. It's a shortest UV path. So if the vertex Y was adjacent to the vertex U, then there would be a shorter path from U to V. We could just go from U straight to Y instead of going to the vertex X and then continue along that same path. So assuming that every minimum UV separating set in the graph G minus E contains K minus one vertices leads to the vertex Y being adjacent to U, which contradicts the fact that P is a UV geodisc, a shortest UV path. Thus, every minimum UV separating set in G minus E must contain precisely K vertices. Of course, it wouldn't make any sense for a UV separating set in G minus E to contain more than K vertices because G minus E is a subgraph of G and a minimum UV separating set in G contains only K vertices. Now, of course, the size of G minus E is less than M, the size of G, since we've deleted exactly one edge. Thus, of course, we can apply our induction hypothesis. 
Our induction hypothesis lets us conclude that there exists a maximum of k internally disjoint uv paths in g minus e, since, again, every minimum uv separating set in g minus e contains k vertices. And then we can throw on an and g there at the end of that statement. There exists a maximum of k internally disjoint uv paths in g minus e, and since g minus e is a subgraph of g, all of those k internally disjoint uv paths will also exist in g. And remember that we can immediately conclude that is the maximum, since at the beginning of the proof we explained how g can't contain more than k internally disjoint uv paths. And my friends, if you're still watching, thank you so much. That's the end of the proof. Those three cases cover all possibilities for the minimum UV separating sets in our graph G, so we have now completed the proof of Menger's theorem. We proved that for two non-adjacent vertices, U and V, in a graph G, the minimum number of vertices in a UV separating set is equal to the minimum number of internally disjoint UV paths in that graph G. Beautiful theorem and a beautiful proof. So I hope this video helped you understand how to prove Menger's theorem. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, need anything clarified, or have any other video requests. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time, and be sure to subscribe for the swankiest math lessons on the internet. And a big thanks to Valo, who, upon my request, kindly gave me permission to use his music in my math lessons. Link to his music in the description.